This tutorial will focus on collecting nutrition data with mobile methodologies. The MVAM tools and methodologies can be used to collect data on the diet of women and young children. Here, we focus on the steps necessary to collect this dietary data. Why do we want to use mobile technologies for collecting nutrition data? Regular and timely data on the dietary intake of women and young children is often missing, particularly from hard to access and insecure areas where the most vulnerable people tend to live. Face-to-face -face interviews in these areas are expensive or often not feasible due to security concerns. Applying remote data collection methodologies to nutrition monitoring has the potential to allow for near real-time, more frequent and cheaper collection, as well as faster analysis of large-scale nutrition data. The information collected via mobile technologies helps to provide early warning of deteriorating nutrition situations and support humanitarian decision-making processes. This initiative also supports global efforts to strengthen nutrition monitoring. Nevertheless, there are some challenges and limitations with using this approach for collecting nutrition data. Collecting data from rural women using remote mobile phone surveys is much more challenging than with face-to-face -face surveys. According to GSMA's 2015 estimates, globally, women are on average 14% less likely than men to own mobile phones. Additionally, socio-cultural norms related to gender roles may discourage women's access to and use of mobile phones. The potential for sampling bias is another big challenge when implementing remote surveys. You can refer to Lesson 6, the module on sampling for remote data collection, for further information on sampling bias and how we address it. Also, changes in the data collection modality may introduce bias and alter results generated from the data. We've done mode experiments to understand how people answer differently based on which mode is used to contact them. This is something we've looked at in more detail throughout the course. Let's now look at the nutrition indicators that we've tested and validated for mobile data collection. The Minimum Dietary Diversity for Women, MDDW, is an internationally validated indicator for measuring micronutrient adequacy of women's diet. MDDW is defined as the proportion of women of reproductive age, 15 to 49 years, who've achieved minimum dietary diversity, i.e. they've met the threshold of five or more groups out of the 10 defined food groups in the past 24 hours. This is important because women tend to be more nutritionally vulnerable, require more nutrient-dense foods than men, and are often disadvantaged in intra-household food distribution. Therefore, MDDW is an important indicator used for targeting, assessment, and monitoring of programs focused on improving nutrition. It's also WFP's corporate indicator to monitor progress towards our micronutrient program, stunting prevention programs, and other nutrition-sensitive programs. The Minimum Acceptable Diet, MAD, is an internationally validated infant and young child feeding, IYCF, indicator. It's used to assess the nutrient density of young children's diet at the population level. MAD measures the proportion of children aged 6 to 23 months who consumed a minimum acceptable diet outside breast milk consumption in the past 24 hours. The MAD indicator is calculated using a combination of two indicators, the Minimum Dietary Diversity, MDD, and the Minimum Meal Frequency, MMF. The Minimum Dietary Diversity measures the proportion of children aged 6 to 23 months who consumed at least 4 out of 7 defined food groups. The Minimum Meal Frequency measures the proportion of children who received more than the minimum meal requirement. The minimum meal requirement depends on the age of the child and whether the child was breastfed or not. For example, the minimum meal frequency is at least four feedings for non-breastfed children aged 6 to 23 months and at least two feedings for breastfed children aged 6 to 8 months. The MAD survey is conducted with the primary caretaker of the child, which is often the mother, but not always. Young children are the priority group for nutrition assessments as nutrition during the 1,000-day period from conception to an infant turning 24 months has a profound impact on a child's health including brain development, growth, and a strong immune system. Infant and young children feeding practices directly affect the nutritional status of children under two years of age.
We will now discuss the key steps necessary to collect MAD and MDDW indicators using CATI, Computer Assisted Telephone Interviewing. As a first step, we highly recommend undertaking a formative study using qualitative research methods to assess the feasibility of contacting women remotely via mobile phones. Once you've determined the feasibility of the project, the remaining steps 2 to 8, from questionnaire design to administration of calls, should be followed. You have already learnt about steps 2 to 8 in other modules, so we'll only look at step 1 in greater detail. For further information on steps 2 to 8, you can refer to the CATI guidance document in the resource section to collect MAD and MDDW. Now, let's discuss in greater detail the first step, the formative study. The decision tree describes the steps that need to be followed to determine if the operating environment is suitable for using CATI to collect dietary data from women. Before starting remote phone surveys with women, it's important to conduct a formative study to understand women's mobile phone usage and any constraints they might have which don't allow them to participate in a CATI survey, what their preferred language of communication is, and what the local diet of the women and young children you are targeting is, and what the local infant and young child feeding practices are. If you look at the decision tree, you can see that the results from the qualitative study should confirm that women's phone access, which includes both ownership and access through sharing, is at least 50%. If this is not the case, CATI is not a feasible mode for contacting women in that area, and it might be necessary to conduct a mixed mode survey. After that, it's important to ensure that there aren't any gender norms that could prevent women from participating in phone surveys, such as not being allowed to talk on the phone with an unknown person, especially if it's a male operator. If there are such constraints related to women's participation, it's important to do sensitization activities, especially among the male members of the community. Another key consideration is trust issues related to answering phone calls from unknown numbers. In the case of such concerns, community sensitization should be done to explain the remote data collection process and its objective. If a designated hotline is used to contact respondents, that number should be shared during this sensitization. Finally, a key objective of the qualitative study is to assess the phone network coverage in the area. If the area has absolutely no network, then remote phone surveys are not feasible. However, in areas with poor network coverage, prior scheduling of phone interviews and multiple phone call attempts could ensure an adequate response rate. We will now briefly focus on a mode experiment we conducted in Kenya to test and validate MDDW and MAD indicators for phone interviews. More in-depth information on the case study can be found in the additional PDF documents. Going to Kenya, our main research question was can mobile data collection methodologies such as CATI be used to collect reliable information on MAD and MDDW? Our mixed method study consisted of two phases. In the formative study, we conducted focus group discussions, key informant interviews, and in-depth interviews to understand how women in Kitui and Baringo counties use mobile phones and what potential barriers there are to reaching women. Once the feasibility of reaching women was confirmed, we conducted a mode experiment to test whether different modes of data collection, which are face-to-face -face and CATI, resulted in different estimates of MAD and MDDW. Our key research questions were, does mode affect estimated population prevalence of adequate nutrition? In other words, do we get different prevalence of MDDW and MAD when we use CATI versus a face-to-face -face survey? Does mode affect individual dietary diversity or meal frequency measures? In other words, do we get different estimates of mean MDDW and MDD scores when we use CATI versus a face-to-face -face survey? Does mode affect survey questions or food groups differently? Does excluding people without mobile phones bias nutrition estimates? And finally, what are the implications of these results for future data collection? Using the test retest design, we compared the prevalence of MAD and MDDW for face-to-face -face and CATI, as well as the mean scores of MAD and MDDW for face-to-face -face and CATI. We also looked at any potential sampling bias and compared the cost of face-to-face -face and CATI surveys. The total sample size was 2,200, and we collected data from 32 sublocations in Kitui and Baringo.
So, what were our results? Can we use CATI to collect data on MAD and MDDW in Kenya? The overall answer is yes, but triangulation of CATI data with other sources of contextual information is important. As with other remote surveys, we found that one advantage of using CATI for nutrition is the savings in cost. For this study, CATI surveys were much cheaper than face-to-face -face surveys. It cost us $5 per successful survey for CATI versus $16 for one done face-to-face. -face. The survey was also feasible in some of the inaccessible areas of the country. Despite poor network coverage in some of the areas, we were able to contact 80% of the participants twice using both modes. While we found a sample bias, as women with phone access have comparatively better sociodemographic characteristics, the MAD and MDDW estimates between the two groups were not significantly different. When we compared the two modes, the MDDW estimates collected using CATI were similar to face-to-face -face estimates. However, estimates of MAD from CATI surveys were much higher than results that came from our face-to-face -face surveys. Despite this result, we found that the mode effect on MAD was consistent. By this, we mean that the scores were consistently higher via CATI across the two rounds of data collection and in both locations, so it is possible to use CATI data to conduct trends analysis using these indicators. As mentioned earlier, there is a potential sampling bias. Thank you for watching this tutorial. You can find out more about the Kenya case study and guidance for using CATI to collect nutrition data in the additional documents.